All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Barnacles, Sea Squirts, and Algae, oh my. My name is Ipsita and I am a public programs intern for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. We conduct research, education, and outreach for healthy coastal ecosystems and communities. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Nina to start the program. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Nina Sassano. I am an educator and the intern coordinator here with the University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. And I'm joining you today from the Skidaway River, which is about eight miles from the Atlantic Ocean. And I am here to tell you about one of my favorite communities you may have never known about. It's a community called the Fowling Community. So you may be wondering, why is it called the Fowling Community? In fact, I would love for you to type in the chat box, what are the first things that come to mind when you hear the word foul? And while you're typing those things in, um, I will break down the other word for you, which is community. And a community is a group of organisms all living together in a shared place. So your community may be your school, it could be your, the town or the city you live in, um, but just a community in general is a group of things living together in one space. And so when we talk about the fouling community, we're talking about a totally different type of organisms all sharing one space. So Epsita, do we have any responses for what people might think of when they hear the word foul? Yeah, we did. So we had people say birds, dirty, bad, interference, and chicken. Bird, dirty, chicken, and interference, and bad. Bird, dirty, chicken, interference, and bad. Excellent. Yeah, those are great ways to describe or great things that come to mind when you hear the word fowl. And sure, sometimes we refer to birds as waterfowl and sometimes chickens are referred to as fowl. But I was actually looking for the other things that you said, dirty, smelly, um, maybe a bad play in a game. And so when we hear those things, when we hear the word fowl being used in those ways, it's not really a good thing. And that's actually how this community got its name by being not such a great thing, but I totally disagree because I think the fouling community is one of the coolest out there. Um, the reason that it's called foul is because we're talking about organisms that make their home living attached and living on docks, on the, underneath docks, on the sides of pilings, and often under boats. And so um, fishermen and boat owners don't love this community because all these things living on the bottom of their boats can slow the boat down and requires maintenance. They have to scrape off all of these community members to make sure their boat um, is up to par and working most efficiently. But aside from that opinion that they're foul, I think that they're super cool. We are talking about a whole group of organisms that live together and that is extremely biodiverse. And so that's our big first science word of the day is biodiverse. And when I talk about a biodiverse community, what I'm saying is that there are a bunch of different living things sharing one space. And so bio means life and diverse means variety and differences. And so this Fallon community is incredibly biodiverse. We have invertebrates, which means they don't have a backbone. We have vertebrates, which are animals with a backbone. We have animals who swim. We have animals who don't swim. We have all different kinds of critters sharing the same space. And we're going to explore that a lot more today. The first example that I can show you is actually right here. And it's something you may have noticed before while you were walking on a dock. We have actually a bit of the fowling community exposed right here on this pier. And believe it or not, there's actually two zones of life living right on this pier. And you may not have even thought of that. This zone right here that we're looking at is a, is a part of the pier that is exposed at low tide. So that means that it's out in the air during low tide and it's actually underwater when the tide comes high. So these animals here have to have the ability to live both underwater and out of the water. And then we have another zone that if you were able to look down in here, you would see that this piling goes down into the water. And then there's a whole bunch of organisms in the fowling community that are living, living beneath the water because they have to have water all the time 
in order to survive. And so these animals up here live, are living in the intertidal zone, which means sometimes they're underwater, sometimes they're out of water. And then the animals under there are in the subtidal zone, which means they need to be living underwater all the time. Kayla, why don't you come up here and take a closer look at these animals and see if anybody can type into the chat box and guess what you're looking at. And these guys are super cool. They're adapted to living out of the water for hours on end. I know I can't live underwater for hours on end, so these guys may even be cooler than me. They actually are able to trap salt water in their shells and hold on to it so that they can continue to breathe until the tide comes back up. And um, we have these organisms, we have oysters, mussels, all different kinds of organisms are actually able to do this, live in the intertidal zone. Kayla, do we have any guesses as to what those organisms might be? Yeah, so we had responses for barnacles and limpets. Well, barnacles, excellent. Those are really great um, guesses, and you guys are right. These are barnacles living in the intertidal zone, and when you were just looking at them, you were actually looking at a living animal. I know when I was young and before I became a marine scientist, when I would see barnacles on the sides of piers like this, I would just think, oh, they're dead, they're out of the water, they're not living. But it's actually, these are alive and conserving their seawater, conserving their water in order to be able to survive until the next tide comes up. So they're super awesome. So this doesn't look very biodiverse, does it? There is just really, we only saw one or two types of organisms living on this pier in the intertidal zone, but it's beneath the water where the magic happens. So I'm gonna come on over here and we're gonna take a look at some of the animals living that live in the subtidal zone of the fowling community. And so you may have walked along docks before, you may have seen, looked down, seen what looks like algae, maybe living on the bottom of those docks, but maybe you never took the time to actually explore what animals were living down there and what creatures were living down there. Um, when you do decide to explore, or if you do decide to explore, and you maybe have a dock that you like to go to, or you have a pier at home that you can walk out on, I definitely don't recommend just bending over because what could happen is you could go for a swim when you didn't really want to. Um, so in order to be very, very safe when you're doing this, you're going to use the proper um, technique. And that is to either get down on your hands and knees and reach in so that you have four points of contact on the pier. Or you can actually just lay down and reach in. And sometimes if you just observe, you may actually start to see things that you never even thought you might see. You might see little shrimp. You might see crabs crawling around down there if you take a closer look. But I'm actually going to pull out a buoy that is going to have all of the Fallon community organisms living on it. So here's an example of what you might look at when you first start to look at the Fallon community. And I know that this doesn't look like much other than a big pile of goop and mud. Um, but I can already see here probably six or seven different types of organisms just by looking at it before I even get my hands dirty. Um, I already pulled out a pipe that has a lot of organisms living on it. And so Kayla will come around in a minute and take a closer look. And then I also have a tub over here where I pulled out some really cool special members of the Fallon community. While you're observing, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how these live every day. So, these animals are what we call benthic sessile organisms. So those are my second and third huge science words I'm throwing at you today, benthic and sessile. Benthic animals refer to animals that are living on the bottom or crawling on a surface. And so you can think of crabs, sea stars, um, certain types of barnacles and oysters and things like that. Those are benthic because they live on the bottom. Now they may not live on the bottom their entire life, um, but they do for at least a part of their life. And now the other word I said was sessile. And so sessile means 
that that animal is actually attached to the surface that it's living on. It's almost like glue. And so your barnacles are those sessile organisms. Um, the algae that you're looking at is sessile. These things are attached to what they're living on. And so they are, um, as an adult, that's where they're going to stay for the rest of their life. However, during some of their life cycles, they are not sessile. They might be free swimming. They might be planktonic. They might be swimming and um, going through the water on their own. And so Kayla right now is exploring some of the animals that we were able to separate earlier. And so you can see some algae in there. You can see some sea squirts in there. I think sea squirts are super cool. They're also called sea grape tunicates. And if you have your ID guide out um, from earlier, you might be able to identify some of those organisms. Another fun little friend in there that you might see swimming around is a blenny. And blennies are members of the fowling community. They're not sessile, so they're not attached to the bottom, but they, they are a benthic fish. And so they like to stay attached and hide. You can see how that blenny just went in and kind of hid among the algae and the sea squirts. And so that's where they spend their lives. So while you observe a little bit, Ipsita is going to throw up a poll for you. Let's test your knowledge. Let's see if you can tell us what a benthic organism is. So Ipsita is going to put that poll up for you. Everybody put in your best guess. And Kayla will share those results as soon as they come up. I'm definitely not a benthic, or I'm definitely not a sessile organism. I am benthic, though. I need to be attached to the ground in order to survive. Um, it looks like some people said plankton, but most people said sea star, 67%. Wow, we have a really smart group of people out there. You should all be scientists one day. You should all be marine scientists one day. Yes, the sea star is the benthic organism. It's the one that's living on the ground. They crawl on the ground. They don't have fins, they're not swimming around all over the place. And actually plankton are free floating. And so they don't live on the bottom, they don't live on the ground. They actually float through the surface of the water, but that's another lesson. So those of you who picked sea star, you're totally right. Um, that is the benthic organism in the list. Um, so these animals are super cool. And no matter where you are, there is a different fowling community her body of water. So I'm standing here on the Skidaway River, but if I were to be standing in the Savannah River, or if I was to be standing in a location in another state, or even a different part of the state, we would see potentially an entirely different set of organisms in the fouling community. So it's really important for that reason to be able to track what we have living on our docks and on our piers. So scientists here have been tracking for years, and when school groups come to visit the Marine Education Center and Aquarium, we actually uh, pull out members of the Fallon community, bring them back to the lab, identify everything that we're able to find, and record it in a notebook. And so we have a, a record of what's been living in our Fallon community right here on this dock for years and years and years. And so we're able to track any changes that might happen. And so what are we really looking for? Well, first of all, we're looking to see if any newcomers join our community. And so if we have an organism that's joining us from another place, it could be what we call invasive. And an invasive animal or an invasive organism is something that moves to a new location but doesn't belong there. And so oftentimes invasive animals don't have very many natural predators, but they have no problem eating what is natural to the area. So how would you think that a benthic sessile organism could come over here and just show up in on our dock if they're stuck on the dock, I wonder? Well, I'm just gonna tell you. We already know that uh, these organisms can travel on boats. And so if we have a boat that's coming to join us from a totally different area or another country, a lot of times shipping boats have um, a pretty big fowling community living um, underneath their hull. 
And so if they come over here and those animals reproduce, a lot of the life cycle for some of these animals involves free floating or swimming parts of the life cycle until they attach onto a hard surface or become sessile. And so that it, we could have travelers and invasive species coming in on the bottoms of boats and attaching to our dock and potentially becoming a nuisance or a threat to some of the organisms that we have living here. And we have seen some invasive species, and I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But another reason that we track what we have living here is because these, if, if one of these animals disappears, we know something else is wrong. Say for years, we have one type of sea squirt that we have living here, and we know it lives here. And then all of a sudden, we come out one summer, and that sea squirt is no longer living on our fowling community. Well, something changed. And so usually uh, these animals are sensitive to changes in the water quality. So if we see that something is, has disappeared or isn't part of the community, any, community anymore, it may be telling us that something's up with the water that they're living in. And so we need to do some more research. And so when I'm talking about water quality, what I'm talking about are things like salinity, temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen. And yes, that's right. Uh, ocean animals and, and river animals, aquatic animals need oxygen just like we do. Um, and so we go ahead and we double check the water quality every time we sample so that we can keep track of those things and maybe make a connection between the animals that we see living in the fowling community and the quality of the water. So one of the tools we use in order to do that is this tool right here. It's called a YSI and it's like a little computer. On the screen, it's going to show measurements for um, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and pH. So these are all really important things to marine animals. Luke's going to tell you all about that when we get into the lab. And then on this part of the YSI, right inside this protective case here are a bunch of little probes that are going to measure those things when I put this in the water. So when we go out to conduct field work, I would just put this probe into the water and let the current run through it for a little bit just so that it gets a very accurate reading. If I read right away, I might not get the best results because it still needs time to acclimate and get the right reading. So I'm watching these numbers change, and as soon as they really start to settle, then I'll go ahead and read off the information, and is gonna put those in the comment box so that we can compare and contrast the water quality of this river um, to things we have in the lab in a little bit. All right, when Ipsita's ready, I can go ahead and I can start reading off these numbers. Okay, awesome. So for temperature, it looks like we have 31.3 degrees Celsius, which don't worry, I know it's in degrees Celsius. That's how scientists uh, measure things, but Luke will convert that into Fahrenheit so we all have a better understanding of what this water temperature is. Um, in terms of dissolved oxygen, so the percent of dissolved oxygen that we have in this water is 73.8% dissolved oxygen. Our salinity here is 26.56 parts per thousand. And Luke is going to tell you a lot more about salinity, but we call that brackish water because it's not quite as salty as the ocean, which would be around 32 parts per thousand. And it's not a fresh water because that would be around zero parts per thousand. And so we have brackish water here at the 26 point parts per thousand. And then we have a pretty neutral pH of 7.31. And so if I was conducting this field work in the field and doing research, I would have a notepad with me and I would be recording all of those things so that along with knowing what organisms we had living here, we would also have daily records of the water quality right here off of our pier. And so with that, um, I'm going to toss it over to Luke. However, if you have any questions that you wanna ask me, type them in the chat box now and send them over to Ipsita and I'll answer specific questions about the Fallon community when we get back inside. Thanks, Nina. My name is Luke Robertson, and I am the Adopted Wetland Coordinator here at University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. And you'll find me here at the Marine Education Center and Aquarium, where I'm at 
what we call the flow through room. Normally this room is full of big tanks, fish and stuff like that, but it's been renovated recently. So we, right now I've just got a few things to show you in here. I'm gonna show you some of our, what we call our fouling plates. Now these are things that you can build at home. We have a link on our website on how to build them. You can hang it up to your dock and it makes it real easy to, uh, to bring in the uh, fouling community inside if you'd like to put them, put them on a microscope or anything like that. Um, you can see this one is basically a brick tied to a, with a zip ties to a piece of flat PVC. And I'll bring it out here just to show you what it looks like. And you can see on the bottom here, little tiny baby barnacles. Look at all of them, they're very cute. They're gonna go big and strong one day. And what we use this, what we use these plates to do is actually get a measure of biodiversity, like Nina said. So we're looking to see what the variety of organisms on this plate are and how many of each one. So you can see there's several baby barnacles out here. And this is only was only out on the river for about a month. So we don't have it growing a lot. You can also see a lot of filamentous algae growing around there, kind of like this wiry, hairy stuff. But if it sits out there for several months, you'll actually see lots and lots of things grow. And I'm gonna show you one that sits in, what we have river water. And this one, you can see it's quite muddy, it's a lot warmer, but there's lots of more filamentous algae. There's a couple more barnacles in here. Um, and if you can see them hiding in there, if you're lucky, yesterday I had a crab crawling on my hand, kind of jumped out of here and he's a little bitty cute crab and kind of tickled my hand as he was doing it. Um, but you can see, you can actually get a measure of biodiversity by counting all these little critters on here. And it's one of the, the things we do with adopt a wetland and you can do at home if you have a dock or something nearby. And now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come back out here, out here in a bit. But first I'm gonna come inside to our plankton, our invertebrate lab and show you some of the, the critters we've pulled off the dock and get you a little closer look. And we'll talk a little bit more about water quality in just a second. So Nina was kind enough to, to bring a couple of things into the lab and put them in a bucket for me right here. And of course this bucket doesn't look like much in there. It looks like a, almost like a bucket of mud. But if you were to look and pull this out and you start to see our sea squirts, our little tunicates right there, these big guys, and they will squirt at you, no doubt about it. And in this filamentous algae is just amazing, amazing little crooks and, and nooks and crannies, all sorts of stuff to hide. And it, it's full, full, full of little bitty things. So I've pulled out a few things just to show you. A, full, a little bit of the filamentous algae. And if you stare at it long enough, you can often see someone swimming around. A uh, little skeleton shrimp, if you look really closely, you see somebody right there. He's kind of, he's, I think I've woken him up, but there's a little skeleton shrimp right here at the end of my finger, and he was trying to sleep. But we've got a couple of the barnacles that sit out there. And you know, we uh, Nina mentioned the intertidal zone, but these guys can also be in the subtidal zone. So you can find these on those blocks that they'll, they'll sit under the water the entire time, filtering and, and uh, pulling food out of the, the water column. There's some more of that filamentous algae. And earlier, I found a worm in here too. Uh, you'll see him right now. Um, and here's lots more of our tunicates, or what we call sea squirts. If you look closely, you can actually see these little, kind of little, almost horns on these guys here. They're very, very delicate with them. Um, these are what's called their, uh, their siphons. And here's a really cool poster of, of the tunicates, the sea squirts. So you can see what they do is like they, they're siphon feeders and they, they use this in-current siphon, they'll bring in water, filter it through, pull out all the food and spit it out. Sometimes they'll spit at you if you're not careful. Um, but they're just adorable and they're, they're one of my favorite creatures that live out here on the fowling community. Um, but sometimes we have some guys who really shouldn't be here and this is part of that um, and that uh, invasive species that might be found on these uh, on our docks. And these these big pink guys, you know, to notice that Nina didn't see anything any of those on our dock. But luckily, we, that's that's a good thing because these are Titan acorn barnacles. They're huge, 
and they do not belong here. And they are really responsible for messing up uh, sewer pipes and, and uh, bilge pumps on boats and things like that. It can be a real big problem. And these are the things that can attach themselves. Their larvae can attach, can find its way into ballast in, in big ships that come in from different places, parts of the world. Or even if uh, sometimes people bring, uh, they're, they've been fishing out in the Gulf of Mexico, then bring their boat over to, uh, over to you know, Savannah without cleaning it out or cleaning out the bilge pump. And sometimes those larvae can be brought over here that way too. Here's some green mussels and they find their ways over here the same way. Uh, you know, the transfer of ballast water from container ships uh, and other different ways. Sometimes shipping uh, is usually, usually sh the shipping is the way they, they find their ways over here. But one of the cool things about this is that these critters, among these critters, one of these is actually quite closely related to humans. Ipsita, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the poll, I'd like you to see, try, trying to figure out which one of these guys is really closely related to humans. And it's, it's not, it's really tough because none of these really look like you or me, right? So I can't wait to see what people have to say because it's, it's just not an easy one. If you see a great, 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 great grandfather in this poll, you let me know. All right. And... Sea squirts. Hey, we have, you know, Nina was right. We do have some budding uh, marine biologists out here. This is great. And uh, so uh, sea squirts, amazingly, are actually, they actually, when they're in larval stage, they have what's called a notochord, or uh, right here, this notochord. It's a great big diagram of them when they're a little bitty. And this is kind of like a very primitive spinal cord. And so that's almost so they they're actually in the phylum chordata, just like humans. Like we have our spinal cord, and we don't look too too different when we're uh, really really little too, uh, in the womb. And but when they finally give, become sessile, meaning they attach to a dock, and they start to grow up like this, and they turn to adults, they lose their notochord. They actually absorb it, almost digest it. So a lot of people sometimes say they're actually eating their own brain, which is awesome. I think that's like one of the coolest things in the world. Um, next thing I want to show you is some of the measurements we talked about uh, that Nina took earlier and water quality. So we talked, uh, Nina talked about how these things can affect our, our commute, fouling community. And so this is part of Adopt a Wetland. What if you want to join Adopt a Wetland as a student, teacher, volunteer, you can go out and figure out what's the health of your waterway near you or near your school, anywhere you want to go. So We'll take, temp we'll take measurements like this. So our temperature out at the dock where Nina took the temperature was 31.3 degrees Celsius. That's about 88, degree, 88 degrees out there. That is warm. Boy, it is almost bath water out there right now. And the dissolved oxygen, about 73.8, still pretty good, but a little bit low. Um, and our pH, 7.31, about average. That, you know, pH, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we go into the... Uh, um, the, foul, the, the, the flow through room here in just a second, but pH, and we'll talk a little bit about here too. So I want to get back to it in just a second. And the salinity is 26 parts per thousand. And as Nina mentioned earlier, it is brackish because we're kind of in between the fresh water and salt water. And that can change dramatically sometimes, whether we have a big, big rain, um, we can, it can, the salinity can go very, very fresh. Um, so that would be lower those, that salinity. So it'd be like, you know, uh, uh, fresh water that comes out of your tap that you drink anytime would be like zero parts per thousand. Whereas ocean water is about 35. So you see, this is 26. It's uh, kind of getting closer up to that ocean where, where if we, and that can, and tides can also affect that kind of thing. Um, and here's the things that we learn because of our water quality measurements. As temperatures go up, dissolved oxygen goes down. So as our oceans warm, as things get warmer, the oxygen that's available for a lot of our critters that, that live in our fouling community and around our wetlands, uh, that goes down. So we want to we measure that to see if that's affecting our community as the dissolved oxygen comes down. So a lot of times you'll see, that's why you see uh, like cold mountain streams are full of undissolved oxygen, whereas these really slow moving uh, warm streams here, kind of lower, but we'll see how things change uh, as we measure them going forward. 
uh, our pH to, on a zero to 14 scale. So that means zero is acidic, very, very acidic, and then high is what's called basic. So uh, uh, acid, something, an uh, example of a really acidic thing would be like uh, your lemon juice, which is very sour, really sour candies. That's gonna be like pH is like three or two. Um, and something that's very basic would be like, uh, I think broccoli is a 10, which is kind of weird. But oceans are normally basic. They're normally not very acidic. They're more basic than your uh, tap water coming out of your faucet, which is about seven. Oceans are normally about eight or nine. And, but that's because of their interaction with carbon dioxide. As carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, we have like global warming, things like that. We have more uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that starts to make the oceans more acidic. And that acidity can actually affect the shells of invertebrates, um, like our barnacles, our crabs, and it can actually eat into their crab and into their shells and make them much more vulnerable to disease and predation. So that's one thing we're also measuring to see how that, that affects our communities. Um, and then salinity, um, we, we're seeing a sea level rise affect this place that used to be freshwater are now saltier and saltier. Um, so it threatens the marsh grass because our marsh grass, if you go out there and see these big open fields of Spartina grass, when you look out the, the wetlands, you're seeing uh, something that's extremely tolerant to salt, but it can't handle like ocean level salt water forever. So it, the, when the rising uh, sea level comes up and it gets saltier and saltier and saltier, they really have a hard time with that kind of stuff. So and if we lose our grass, we lose our, our marshes. And then freshwater wetlands are also uh, kind of under threat to rising salinity. So uh, if you go to uh, the Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, which is normally a great freshwater habitat for alligators and lots and lots and lots of birds, um, they're, they're really struggling to make sure that their, uh, their habitat stays fresh um, and when, uh, the, as the water uh, around them gets saltier and saltier. And one other word, one, another big science word that I want to talk to you about because it does involve a lot of the animals in our fowling community are macroinvertebrates. And these are very important to figuring out the water quality and the health of a lot of our, our streams and rivers and wetlands. So macro means seen with the naked eye. You don't need a microscope to see these guys. So that'd be like our sea squirts and our barnacles, crabs, things like that. And invertebrate, of course, we talked about this earlier and Nina did a great job, no backbone. So macroinvertebrates are a really good measure of water quality. And this is my joke for the day I want to show you. Um, did you hear about the game between the ocean and the beach? It was tied. It's one of our big subjects today and I want to show you, share with that with you. So now I will go back into our flow through room to show you a little bit more about our fouling plates and talk a little bit more about water quality and we'll wrap up a little bit after that. One second, this will just bear with me for a minute. Okay. Hi, Kayla. Kayla, Kayla is gonna show uh, me coming into our filing plates. I wanna talk a little bit more about these filing plates too. Uh, we uh, use the protocol that's actually the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center up in Maryland uh, gave us the protocols to build these. So we're working with them to see if this is the, the this kind of the, the general one we want to use going forward or if we want to change it in the future, see how people like it. Um, and you see one of the things we've tried to do with, with these two tanks is compare uh, acidity or sorry, uh, yeah, the, the acidity or pH here. And what I've done is actually take a little bit of sample of the water out of here and put it into the vial with a little bit of this reagent. And if you've ever done uh, lifeguarding or anything like that, you know how to, you've done this before probably. And what you'll do, you'll take a little bit of the water, put in your, your reagent into here, shake it up, and you actually compare the, the, the colors here with this gauge. And it'll tell you exactly how acidic or basic your water is. You see here, this is about seven and a half, about seven. We want to see how the acidity would change with one getting fresh ocean water and one being kind of stagnant. 
but really they've been very resilient and stayed very, very um, similar for several weeks. So we were very impressed of how resilient this community is. But um, yeah, if you ever want to learn more about Adopt a Wetland and want to become one of the, uh, the many volunteers all up and down the coast, or if, you're, if you live near freshwater and want to become a part of the Adopt a Stream program, which works with us as well, um, email me or when my contact information should be on the web. And more information about the Adopt a Wetland program is also posted up on our links. So I think that's all I have for now. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I think we've got a little game coming up for you. All right. Welcome back, everybody. That was super cool, Luke. Thank you for sharing all that awesome information with us. And now we're going to give you a little bit of a pop quiz. Don't worry, it's not too hard and it's definitely not super long. But we thought this would be a fun way to see if you uh, got anything um, or learned anything from this program. And so everybody get your little clickers ready. We're going to go through these questions. I'll ask the question, give you the options, and then you can answer in the form of a poll. And we'll see, uh, we'll see what you've learned. Okay, so... Let's move on to the first question. Okay, now you may have gotten a, a fouling ID guide ahead of time in your email link. So you may be able to refer to that as we go through this. But the question here is, what is the name of this marine invertebrate that we find in the fouling community? Option A is sea grape tunicate, B is hydroid, C is sea whip, and D is nudibranch. So let's see, we got some answers coming in. I'll give everybody a few more seconds. Okay, and so uh, it looks like every, almost everybody got it right. 11 of you guessed correct. This was a sea grape tunicate. Um, these were those sea squirts that we were taking a look at. Those great, great, great ancestors, according to Luke. Um, so you all, a lot of you got that right. Way to go. Okay, let's move on to the next question. The next question is, can you identify this invertebrate? This organism lives in the intertidal zone. Okay, your options are A, amphipod, B, bryozoan, C, skeleton shrimp, and D, ivory barnacle. So go ahead and place your votes. Oh, boy. Seems like everybody knows what this one is. Okay, the polling has ended and 100% of you got it right. That's awesome, this was an ivory barnacle. See, you did learn something today. That's great, okay, let's move to the next question. What is the term used to define animals that live part or all of their lives attached to a structure? Is it A, pelagic, B, glued, C, sessile, or D, sticky buns? <laughs> do, 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 do. All right, the votes are in, and most of you got it right. The answer was sessile, uh, although some people did go for glued. Um, that is kind of similar to how we might imagine that they're attached, but their term is actually sessile. Um, for those of you who don't know, pelagic animals are ones, pelagic means to swim freely through the water. So a lot of our fish are pelagic, um, but, but most of you got this right. Those that are attached to a surface their whole life are considered sessile and nobody gets sticky buns. Man, you guys are really smart. We couldn't even trick you. Okay, next question. Which of these is not something that we measure when we measure water quality? Is it A, pH, B, salinity, C, taste, or D, temperature? <laughs> we couldn't trick you again. Everybody pretty much got that right. So yeah, the answer was taste. 
Um, I wouldn't recommend using taste as a measure of water quality. You just never know what's in that water that you don't want to be that you don't want to be taking in your mouth. <laughs> All right, let's go to that last question. What is the common name for this benthic invertebrate? Is it A, a mud crab, B, a blue crab, C, a fire crab, or D, a sea spider? So this one was a little tricky. I'm not sure if we actually got to see one of these up close today. And the boats are coming in. All right, awesome. A lot of you answered mud crab and that was correct. Sometimes we do see blue crabs living among the fouling community and they can be found under those docks and using that algae and that fouling community to protect themselves and hide from predators. Um, but the ones that we were looking at today, we didn't see any blue crabs, we did see some mud crabs. So most of you got that right, so very good job. All right, and I believe that that's the end of our quiz. And so now uh, Luke and I are here to answer any questions you might have. So go ahead and you can type your questions in the chat box and Epsita will go ahead and let us know uh, what questions you have for us. Yeah, so we did have a question for you, Luke. Um, what is pH? Oh. pH is actually a, a measurement of ions in the water. Uh, so it's, it's a, um, a positive charged ions in the water. And so it's kind of hard to, to define, but it's a measurement of, that we use to figure out how acidic or basic uh, our water quality might be. Um, but you can use it, uh, and you can, like I said earlier, you can have uh, acidity and, uh, and uh, measured in like your orange juice or your lemon juice or like a battery acid that you like your batteries actually have are very, very, very acidic inside them. Um, so it's, uh, it's, um, and it's, uh, a lot of times you're eating food, you'll notice how like, Oh, this is very sour. It means it's very basic. Um, so it's a kind of a different way to figure out, um, if you can actually, it's, I don't know, it's hard to, to describe sometimes, but it's a really, really cool way uh, of how we measure our water quality and how it affects the, a lot of the, uh, the, 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 animals that live in the water. Awesome. Um, so this one's for you, Nina. Are barnacles edible? So that's a great question. Um, I wouldn't eat the barnacles off this pier, uh, probably no matter how hungry I was, but there are some types of barnacles uh, around the world that are considered a delicacy. Uh, it just depends on where you are and, and what you might like. But I know in Japan that they do serve barnacles and a lot of people consider them a delicacy. Um, and then this one's for either of you. Um, how much of a salinity change can there be in brackish water before it adversely affects the organisms? And then to go off of that, how much can brackish water change throughout the day or seasons? Those are excellent questions. Nina, do you mind if I take that one? Go for it. So, so uh, brackish water can change dramatically um, over a, a few days um, and over the seasons. Uh, you'll, you'll, especially if we, we had uh, in February, we had big, big rains here. We had a lot of fresh water coming down uh, all our rivers and we had a lot of flooding going on. And around here, we saw a uh, very, very fresh water. We, we, you know, we saw today our measurements of uh, salinity was uh, about 26. You know, it's very, very high, closer to ocean water. Um, but we were seeing salinities at Fort Pulaski, you know, near, almost right to the ocean near, uh, near Tybee of seven, five, you know, extremely low, low uh, salinities because there was so much fresh water coming down. However, we can see very, very high salinities. I've seen uh, almost to the 30s here at our dock when we have very, very high tides. Um, so it can dramatically change from tide cycle um, and just depending on the storms that might be in the area. That's very interesting. Um, so we had a lot of questions come up about the mud crab. 
Um, some of them being, um, why is it called a mud crab? Um, where do you find these mud crabs? And then can they be male and female? I'll go take that one. Um, you know, I'm not totally sure why they're called mud crabs. My guess, it could be that they have, they are the same color as mud. They live on the Fallon community, which often has mud among it. So maybe that's why they're called mud crabs, but that's a really great question. And I can find an answer for you um, and get back to you after. Um, they live along the Fallon community when they're really tiny. So the ones that we saw today were itty bitty. They were probably within their first year of life. And um, I've seen mud crabs just living benthically near the Fallon community and in our rivers and um, in our estuaries. And then Ipsita, what was the last question? I'm sorry, there were three. Um, where do you find mud crabs? Um, why are they called the mud crab? And then can they be male and female? Oh yes, they can definitely be male and female. And as they grow older, just like with other crabs, there are ways to tell um, whether they're male or female just by looking at them. Um, but when they're super tiny, it is really hard to tell right off the bat. And then additionally, what do they eat? So when they're really small, they're just kind of scavengers. Most crabs are scavengers. And so they're just picking up what they might find on the bottom. So they're kind of picking through the algae. They're eating teeny tiny organisms that are living among the algae in the fowling community. As they get larger, they might eat um, whatever they can catch. So fish, or if things are decaying, they might go ahead and, and pick at those things. Um, whatever they can catch really, they're going to go ahead and eat. Awesome. Um, so we also had a couple of questions on barnacles. Um, how do barnacles multiply and reproduce? And then another question about barnacles was, um, will any animals live in the empty shell of a dead barnacle? Nina, do you want to take these? You're very good at this kind of stuff. Sure. I saw you reaching for your mute button. I didn't know if you were going to take it or not. Um, so a lot of these animals have multiple parts in their life cycle. So what will happen is um, when barnacles reproduce, they actually can release their gametes. They're called gametes into the water. They'll fertilize and then they'll attach once they're ready. Once the larva will float through the water and then they'll, um, they'll attach to a surface when they're ready to grow into adults. Um, so what you're seeing when you see a barnacle is the adult uh, form of that organism. Um, and the other question was, once they die, do their shells get used for a house for other animals? So I'm thinking maybe you're thinking of, of hermit crabs that use shells of other snails and other organisms as a home um, after the snail leaves the shell. And I don't know of any animals that specifically would pick a barnacle up and use it as protection, but I do know maybe there are small little creatures, maybe there's tiny amphipods and little things like that that would hide within um, the space that used to be occupied by a living barnacle um, in order to, to stay protected and remain safe from predators. That's great. Um, so we did have some questions of um, wondering what people saw um, on the dock with you. Um, if you can remember what was there. Um, one person asked, what was the thing in the bowl? And then another person was wondering, um, what are the little bugs on fuzzy ropes? Okay, awesome questions. Um, uh, we had a bunch of different little organisms living in that, that I pulled out to put in the in the bowl, I'm, I, I hope you're talking about the clear plastic tub that we had. Um, I, there were some sea grape tunicates and some sea squirts in there. Um, there was some filamentous algae. I don't know specifically what kind. Um, there were a few mud crabs, although I think that they were hiding among the sea squirts and the algae. And then there were two little blennies. And so those blennies are little fish that live among the fowling community and they are super cool. They have modified fins that actually help them Kind of stay put and so they blend right in there that blue uh, brown color and they blend right in right with the extra with the rest of the fowling community so they stay protected and camouflaged by just kind of a 
sitting on the surface. Um, and then the other question was, what were those little tiny insects on the fuzzy row? Um, those are actually called amphipods. And so those are like little tiny aquatic crustaceans. They eat and break down organic matter. So as things die, those amphipods will go through and they will actually eat things that are decaying. They're really important. They're almost like little insects. So um, I actually think of them as the rivers version of the roly polies. So if you ever picked up a brick and looked underneath it and saw those little roly polies, um, when you look closely at an amphipod, it kind of looks like that. Um, so that's probably what you saw on the ropes. And it could have also been skeleton shrimp, which is another type of organism that we see in the Fallon community. And they're like a little clear shrimp that lives there too. All right, and then um, this question is for both of you. Um, what are your favorite parts of the Fallon community? I'll go, I'll go first. I, 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 I think that if that's okay. Um, I, lo I love the tunicates. The sea grapes are the, the best. They're so cute. Uh, they, they, they like squirt, you know, they, they have the little squirt guns that, that they get at you every time you pull them out of the water. Um, their development is really cool and it's very nerdy, but I love how like they, they, they you know, they're sort of related to humans and they, um, you know, but they, you know, they eat their brain when they get bigger. So that, that is like uh, amazing. Uh, so I love, I love the sea grapes. They're definitely my favorites, uh, but there's so much cool stuff. You, open, you pull up those bricks and you see so many cool things. Just like you let it, you sit there and look at it just for a few minutes and the place just explodes with life. So it's, there's so many to choose from. And uh, I'm a little bit biased because I got my master's degree studying the life cycle of jellyfish. And actually part of the jellyfish life cycle is that it is part of that fouling community. It is a little polyp that is sessile and it attaches uh, among those other fouling community members. So I love um, learning about jellyfish. And so that's one of my favorite members of the community. Um, but one of my favorite things in general about the community is we got to look at this group of organisms from a bird's eye view, from a macro view today. But what I really love is getting a little bit of that under the microscope and really just watching what's living there. I've seen things like little nudibranchs living under the microscope. I've seen tiny little organisms that I had no idea were even living in there because I can't see them with just my regular eyes. And um, that just adds to the biodiversity. And in my opinion, it adds to how cool that community really is. Yeah, Nina, I want to add one more thing. Uh, also sea spiders, they're really hard to see and they're, you don't see them very often. And they're so tiny. And I mean, they're not, they're, they're, they, they look like little spiders. They almost, if, you're, if you don't have a microscope, they look like just a piece of lint, a moving piece of lint that just kind of crawls through. But if you look up tiny, you can see the little arms kind of poking their way through the filament of algae. Another one that I, I absolutely love. So very cool. And like Nina said, there's so many critters to choose from there uh, that they're all very, very neat. Those are awesome. Um, we had a question, um, another couple of questions on barnacles. Um, what do they eat? And then how do you remove barnacles? Luke, do you want me to take this one? Um, I'm going to start by saying I'm not a barnacle expert, so I'm answering these questions to the best of my knowledge, but um, I'm sure you can get way more information um, if you're really interested in barnacles um, by doing some research of your own. Um, barnacles are suspension feeders, and what that means is while they're attached, they're obviously not hunters. They're not going around and finding prey or anything like that because they are just sitting there um, attached to the surface that they're on or if they're on a piling, they may be sitting this way. And so imagine that this is a little barnacle mouth. As water is flowing past the barnacle, there are tiny little things, um, tiny little organisms like plankton and things living in the water that the barnacle actually, as it passes over the barnacle's mouth, it then can filter in and take what it is that um, is suspended in that water and eat it. So um, that's what that's something called suspension feeding and that's how barnacles eat. And then um, it's really not very hard to, as a human, to pull a barnacle off of the 
um, piling. So all you have to do is really just kind of get your fingers under there and scrape it. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, they like to stay in place. And so as best you can, I wouldn't mess with the barnacles, but it's not too hard to pull them off. Luke, did you have something to add? I did. I was going to mention that a lot of ships, you know, they can really get uh, fouled up with a lot of barnacles. So now, nowadays, people use what's called anti-fouling paint that will actually uh, resist the attachment of barnacles on, onto their hulls. Um, as, that, as that paint wears off, barnacles can start to attach later. But you'll see barnacles and all sorts of things. Uh, I know if you ever are lucky enough to see a, a, a hawksbill turtle or a... a or excuse me, a loggerhead turtle, a lot of times barnacles are actually attached to them. Um, and sometimes the, the people who do research on sea turtles will actually pop those off from time to time um, because they can be like right, right on their heads, they can obstruct their vision sometimes. Um, so barnacles don't just attach to docks. They can attach to moving things out there. You know, they're floating around the water and they attach where they can. Very neat though. Thanks for adding that. And then um, one person did ask, um, after you showed the Petri dishes, Luke, um, what is a skeleton shrimp? <laughs> That's a good question. They're another one of the many uh, macroinvertebrates. They're very small. And actually, we have a, uh, we have a guide that's posted on our link. Uh, that's a, a, we have the link up on the webpage uh, that has a, a kind of invertebrate guide. They can show you closer up photos of these things. But they're very, they're, they look like, I think what what could I describe them? They only they look like little aliens, but they're very kind of segmented uh, shrimp. They don't look like your shrimp that you are eating, you know, shrimp cocktails or your fr or your uh, fried shrimp at dinner and like that. They're much more you know, segmented when they run around. But they're um, uh, yeah, that, that's that's hard to describe <laughs> exactly. And Nina, do you have a better description than I have? They're just a type of shrimp. Um, yeah. They're just a really tiny type of shrimp that lives among the fowling community. There are many different types of shrimp and species of shrimp. So what you might be used to seeing on um, in the fish market is different from what a skeleton shrimp actually looks like, but they are all related. Exactly. Thanks, Nina. All right, so that does look like that's all the time we have for questions right now, but I want to thank you so much for um, teaching the program. It was amazing. Um, so if you had fun today, then I hope you will consider checking out our YouTube page for recordings of all of our programs this summer. In addition, Thursday at 2 p.m., we have our final program in a virtual series for families with children ages four to eight years old with this week about shark sketches. This is the first summer that we have done virtual programs and your feedback is incredibly valuable for shaping what these programs look like moving forward. Please take one minute to fill out the survey in the chat box. The chat box will disappear when we end the meeting, so go ahead and click that link now or copy and paste into a new window so that you have it for after the meeting. We will be offering virtual fall public programs starting September 24th through November, so check back on our website in early September for a calendar of topics. This survey, um, the Qualtrics link, is your last chance to give us more topic ideas you would like to see in the fall, so make sure you fill it out um, and thank you in advance. I do want to give a big thank you at this time for any friends in the audience as your donations and support help us offer educational programming this summer. And if anyone is interested in becoming a friend, the application is on our website. You can also stay connected with us after this program by attending other public programs, following us on social media, or learning about our volunteer and internship opportunities. Thank you for joining us and see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.